he was most likely an embarrassment. He had been that way since he had gone blind. You see, he would sit there on the mat with his tin cup in his hand begging for alms, gifts for the poor, gifts for the poor. He would cry out from his darkness, and people would step around. Those Some would actually dare to put a coin in, and he would say, thank you, thank you. May the Lord bless you. And then his litany would resume, gifts for the poor, gifts for the poor. It hadn't always been that way, according to the story. The, the son of Timaeus, and we will do a little uh, study of his name here in a moment, was born most likely <clears throat> a very healthy baby boy. Played with the other children at Jericho and even attended school, but then something happened, and so Bartimaeus lost his sight, and he became a problem in his hometown. You see, from all appearances, his family put him out on the street. The synagogue had deemed him unfit as an outcast, and his friends abandoned him. And so there he was, likely very alone on the roadside, and he heard the commotion, an approaching crowd. It's Jesus. Someone whispered, it's Jesus. So shut up and don't humiliate us. But this time, Bartimaeus had an incentive. And so his incentive was to call out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You can imagine that men surrounded him and they shielded him from Jesus' sight. They wanted his voice to quieten down, but it did not do that at all. But rather, he said, Jesus, have mercy. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And amazingly, you know the rest of the story. Jesus stops. And he says, call him here. And suddenly the man's life was changed forever. He had a face-to-face -face encounter with the, the Savior. And Jesus asked the man, what do you want me to do for you? It seems a rather silly question, doesn't it? Hello, Jesus. You know, you can see this thing going on here, but isn't it obvious what he's asking for? But the question Jesus asked was brilliant and insightful. He wanted the man to be very specific, as he wants you and I. The blind man did not ask for prayer. He did not ask for financial security. He did not ask for protection from the locals. He was quick with his request. I want my sight back. And Jesus was just as immediate with his response. What he said to him, go, your faith has healed you. No spittle in the healing story here, no showing of oneself to the religious authorities. Jesus saw in this blind man two things, the desire for change and a belief that somehow Jesus could provide that, and he did so. And from that moment on, he was, from all likelihood, from what we know from the story, he was a follower. And so we reflect yet again on another one of Mark's healing stories here. And I wonder what need you have pressing in on your life this morning that only the Son of God can pay attention to in terms of giving you that request. What would yours be if he walked down this aisle and you somehow stopped believing he was some kind of a genie popping out of a lamp and offering you three wishes, but he was simply saying to you, is there something in your life that is missing? Is there a void? Is there an emptiness? Is there something missing in your life? Bartimaeus, the character in our scripture today, wanted his sight back. Now let me dig just a little bit deeper into this. The names here are good in that names are important and the story is important. So if I could go just one level deeper with you, hang with me. I'd never noticed this in the story until this time through. Bartimaeus literally means son of Timaeus. Now that doesn't sound all that earth shattering, but look what it does. We recently have a new friend in our lives that has speaks several different languages, and I'm always amazed, and they talked with us yesterday about how, you know, you, you can speak one language and be in another culture and speak another language, and there are shared ex words that, you know, you can catch up on and pick up on. Well, this son of Timaeus was, in Latin, it means son of fear. 
and in Chaldean it meant son of the unclean. Now, obviously, both of those would apply in this situation, but notice what it means in Aramaic. You remember what Aramaic is. Aramaic is the language most often used related to Greek that we suspect Jesus himself used. It was Aramaic. And so when we get to when Jesus in the, past, in, uh, the gospel says, my father, Abba, that's, that's an, uh, a word we can't completely translate in the Greek. It's from the Aramaic. And so it's just daddy. It, it literally, it's so personal, it means daddy. Here in the Aramaic, it means son of the precious. Son of the worthy one. And probably best translated, as I looked into, in, into what the other writers would say, they said, son of honor. Now, now get what's happening in this passage. There's this Bartimaeus title using what he addresses Jesus as. Jesus has got all this other stuff going on over here, getting ready to heal him. And why did Bartimaeus get his attention? Well, maybe it was because what he called him. He called Jesus son of David. Now, this is one of the traditional titles used for the Messiah. And so it means son of the beloved or beloved son of God. Now, now catch on what, what the imagery is doing here. The son of the beloved is leaving Jericho, followed by his disciples in the crowd. And on their way out, he encounters a blind beggar, the son of fear, or the son of unclean, who cries out to him, Messiah, beloved son of God, have mercy on me. And Jesus, does, at first Jesus doesn't hear the son of the unclean, but either that or Jesus wants those around him to hear what's going on with the blind beggar, Messiah, beloved Son of God, have mercy on me. Now, we'll come up from this in just a minute, but one more point. Jesus calls him over, asks him what he wants, and this son of the unclean wants to see again. And with only one word, Jesus transforms the blind beggar from the son of the unclean, a son of honor. The beloved Son of God restores the son to honor. Now, I don't know about you, but that, that just does me in. What has found you this week where you needed someone to lift you up and translate your name into something new, something honorable, something encouraging, something of value? We're going to move fairly quickly. You have three points we're going to make. We're talking about healing faith today. What does healing? In other words, how did Bartimaeus come to this moment where he experienced a healing faith that embodies the hope that we want and need? What were the ingredients of that? Well, first of all, healing faith always asks. It asks. Bartimaeus had faith enough to ask. One of the folks that I read called it a fast-forward faith. In other words, he was fast-forward. He wasn't afraid to lay it out there. Well, desperate people never are. He wanted to get it out there. He had a chance. He saw it, and he wanted it. Some of you know of my courtship with Neva, um, my, my wife of 40 over years now. And, but it didn't always go so you know, smoothly. I was very, very religious. I was in my monk stage, and monks stayed away from women, you know. We just stayed away from women, you know. Even good-looking ones that walked into my class and sat close to me. I, I will tell you, I was uncomfortable. There was awakening something inside of me that I had said didn't exist anymore. <laughs> and I remember asking her finally, she came to a prayer meeting I was a part of, and there we stood at the, you, some of you know the story, we were standing in the parking lot at Christ Episcopal Church, and I said, I think I might want to start seeing you, and she looked at me and said, it's about time. <laughs> and I will tell you, that's the only time any woman in my life ever accused me of going slow. I just said, that would never had been a problem. See that undercurrent you just felt? You were a little, a little weird. You don't think your pastor is really alive and well. He is. But you got to want something and be able to go after it. And after that time, 
the ask was on and, and, and the relationship began. How many things do we not have from God because we do not ask, we do not think we deserve, we do not think he even is in the business of wanting to make us whole. We think the rest of our lives is just going to be dragging around as folks who are in need of healing when in fact God wants to heal us. But, we have, but, we, but part of the process is we need to ask. God is willing to transform our names and our lives into sons and daughters of honor, sons and daughters of the beloved. Secondly, healing faith believes. It really believes. Now, I'm not just talking about a light and fluffy belief. I'm not just talking about head knowledge. I'm talking about a connection between the head and the heart that is so connected that says, I believe this and I'm going to stay committed to this. I've been watching a couple of our staff members, the lady that works with our children and the one who leads us in music, both have had children the last little bit, and it's interesting to watch them fumble, bumble their way through being new mothers. I, fumble and bumble, that's what they're doing, you know. They're, they're just kind of experiencing this thing. They're of the, they're the Google generation, so they take no information from me, who is the fabulous father, and who've learned all the things that they need to know, but there they are fumbling and bumbling. And it is interesting to watch their children and watch them look into their eyes and, and that believing starts taking place. You know, um, Iris will look at me and then she'll look at her mom like, who is that? And then, you know, little Martin will glance over, but he looks back at his mom and they, they're, because they're, they're believing in something. Thought of the story, I thought of the story of, of Fred Craddock, one of my many 25 stories I know about him. He was a chaplain for the weekend. Unlike, I mean, like many of us preachers, we, we first serve in county seat towns. There's opportunity, there's a rotating uh, time when you are on for that weekend or something. Uh, you're just on at the, at the hospital in case somebody needs something. And so you're, you're a chaplain for the week or the weekend. And so he was at a rural hospital there in Georgia as a small, very small hospital. But he got called. Uh, there was a new baby born, and he was called to, to the go to the hospital. And there he looked in. That's back when you couldn't get in to, you know, be a part of the, of the experience. You just had to stand behind that long glass window there. And so he made his way in, Dr. Craddock did, and he, he saw a crowd of people around a window. He assumed that that's where it was, and... The, he looked in, he saw the child's gender, and he asked the folks about her, and they said her name is Elizabeth, and then he found who he was looking for, and that is the young father who was leaning against a wall. And so Craddock congratulated him on the beautiful baby. They could see that Elizabeth was through the glass, and she was squirming, and her face was all red, and all of a sudden this red-faced little girl was screaming, and the young father, Craddock thought, you know, here I am, the pastor, I need to help comfort him and help him to understand this since I'm not a new father. So he looks at the man and he explains. He says, it's good for babies to scream and do all that. It clears out their lungs and it gets their voices going. And the dad, without even looking over, says, oh, I know what. She's not sick, but she's mad as hell. <laughs> and Craddock just leans back and thinking for a moment, he says, oh, pardon me, Reverend. He said, no, 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 that's all right. Now he's intrigued. So he says, why is she so mad? And the father says, well, wouldn't you be mad? One minute you're with God in heaven, and the next minute you're in Georgia. <laughs> and Craddock says, you believe she was with God before she came here? And he says, yes. And then Craddock asks an interesting question. He says, do you think she'll remember? And the young father said, well, that's up to her mother and me. It's up to the church. We've got to see that she remembers. Because if she forgets, she's a goner. Now, I will tell you that that is the gospel, and that is the church. From down that hallway to those little babies that are down there and all the way through life, you and I have the opportunity to believe and to give that belief through our lives. I want to live 
every second, of every minute, of every hour, of every day of my life in believing in such a way that I will help somebody on their way back to be with Jesus. Why don't we believe that? Because, I mean, Jesus, and look, just look at Scripture, I will never leave you orphaned, I will, not leave, I will not leave you and forsake you, lo, I am with you always, and yet the miracles to us are somehow stumbling blocks. We live in such a scientifically sophisticated world today that we somehow believe that medical science, who produces miracles, if we think about it, because they are dis making discoveries all the time that go against the natural laws of the, that govern our world, couldn't God possibly do some of that? There's a new book out. I haven't gotten it yet, but I've been reading about it. I read an interview with Lee Strobel this past week. You'll see a, a picture of it here. Lee Strobel, is the, he's the fellow who um, was an atheist. He worked for the um, Chicago paper, the Chicago Tribune, I believe. As an atheist, he began doing some research on Christians, and lo and behold, he had a profound encounter with Christ. And many of you have read books. If you've read The Case for Christ, that's, that's Lee Strobel. I met Lee uh, a number of years ago when I was in Nashville. He's quite, quite the guy. So I'm intrigued about this new book that he's got out. Half of Americans, he's, he's done some research, he says half of Americans, 51%, said they believe in the miracles of the Bible. And I get that. The, the old world that I look out on sometimes doesn't seem to believe any of that. But Barna has done the research, and they believe, half of Americans said that they believe the miracles of the Bible actually happened. Two out of three, or 67%, said that the miracles are actually possible today. Now, now is that mind-boggling? And only 15% said they're not. And another study that I thought interesting that he includes in his book is that 55% of the, uh, the, of the physicians in America believe that they encounter miracles in what they do every day. Now, we have a couple physicians in here today, and I guarantee you they would lean into agreeing with that. Anne Lamott says it this way. When God is going to do something wonderful, he always starts with a hardship. When God is going to do something amazing, God always starts with an impossibility. And he does. Healing faith asks, healing faith believes, and healing faith follows. From everything I can see here, old Bartimaeus was changed, and he was on his feet, and he was wanting to follow. Steve Mullen and his wife uh, served in Tanzania as missionaries for a while. And I remember my third world experience. If you've ever been in a third world, you know what I'm talking about. If you are in a third world country outside of the big city that's there, like, um, you know, this, the bush where we, I've, I've served before, I've gone to before. When you're around folks like that, first of all, you're typically the, one of the taller ones there, and you are incredibly different color and you uh, are looked up to by them because they see you as healthy, wealthy, and wise. They just do. You may be none of those, but to them you are. And so they were just getting used to Tanzania when a little group of black kids began running up to them. And it just scared them. It took them back. They said, immediately started grabbing onto their wallets and their purses. You know, they thought, what's going on here? And what the little kids really wanted was they had seen them taking a picture with their camera. And they wanted to see the pictures. As he thought about that later, he said, you know what? They just wanted to see what we see. That's ultimately what the blind man wanted, wasn't it? He didn't want just his sight back, but somehow he believed in the midst of getting his sight back, he wanted to see what Jesus saw. And I will tell you that if you and I really want to be changed by the power of Christ in our lives, ask God to do that in your life. Ask God to do that in your life. It's kind of a prayer dare. <laughs> ask God to let you see as he sees. You want to, you want to get your life changed? Let 
God change what you see into what he has seen and how he sees it. Pray that prayer. What would happen to us if we did that? Well, Keith Green wrote a song a long time ago and talking about the church. He says we're sometimes asleep in the light. And he, he's, he's right. We, we folks in the church can get awfully comfortable. If Jesus came back and told the story, the story of the Good Samaritan again, I wonder if we might be the priests and the Levite. I wonder if our cities were 24-hour, uh, 21st century Jerichos, if you would, the, the blind and the lame and the disenfranchised would not be seen by us. If Jesus entered most of our synagogues, and I expect that we would be leaning toward more of the Pharisees type. And you remember what Revelation 3.20 said, don't you? Lukewarm lives make him, well, let's use the cleaned up word, throw up. Several years ago, a church wrote their mission statement, their new vision statement, um, purpose statement. And so wanted to make it concise and clear like ours is, and so they wrote this. Grounded in faith, gathered in love, sent with a purpose so that others may gain the kingdom. When I read the story of what, what this pastor experienced, he said one of the members immediately came up to him and said, Others, others, what about me? What about us? The pastor died and went to heaven. No, I mean, it's just, it just the feeling of we still just don't get it sometimes, do we? Someone has said, until we come to faith, the gospel is always about us. But once we come to faith, the gospel is always about others. So let me remind you and take you to a place where you get a prayer dare. And that is, let you see your world as Jesus sees it. Two more brief stories. This one um, was in the legend category, although I've heard it used truthfully, and it certainly sounds like Abraham Lincoln. He came up on a slave auction right as the Civil War was ending, and they were liquidating slaves. In other words, they were, it was time to go ahead and get, get rid of your slave if you're going to get anything for it because they were going to be declared free. And so it was a liquidation sale, if you would, and so he came up, and a young lady was placed on the auction block, and there he watched as her face was looking out, and it was just broke his heart. So finally he bid on her and won that auction, took possession of the woman, and by then she's still very uh, uneasy and belligerent. She looks at him, and she says, what are you going to do with me? And he looks at her and says, I'm going to set you free. She says, set me free. What do you mean, set me free? Free for what? Abraham Lincoln said, free. Free to do what you want to do. Free to go where you want to go. And the astonished woman thought for a moment. And she said, then I'll choose to go with you. You see, life in Christ is this odd kind of freedom. It's a freedom where you and I submit ourselves to him, and out of that we submit our self to his life. And the one who gives us freedom, we submit to for the rest of our lives. And so we live in a kind of strange freedom. Some of you are wearing your green today, and what you may not know is St. Patrick's Day is not just about green beer. I know that's what most of you did yesterday, just sat back and had green beer all day. But Patrick is a recognized as a patron saint of Ireland. But get this, he was not born there. His given name was not Patrick. So what is true? Well, he was born in 385 A.D. He was a Roman Catholic. And by his own description, at age 16, he was, mil he was uh, materialistic, licentious, and covetous. Now, basically, if you and I would have characterized that in our terminology, we would say he was heathen. And at age 16, he was carried off by some mara Irish marauders who sold him as a slave. And for six years, he toiled as a sleep sheep herder. And during the pay that period of slavery and solitude, his life began to change. He had an awareness of God that began to be very real for him. And he escaped slavery and began to study for 12 years at a monastery. And there he was 
since his call to serve Christ. Two things that we need to remember about him. First, he had hoped to become the first bishop of Ireland, but he was not considered smart enough or significant enough in his belief that they chose him. So he became the second one. He was chosen finally, and he served in that role for 30 years. The other thing you need to know about him is that his imposing presence and winning personality is one that, that threw him into jail 12 different times because he was so excited about telling people about Christ that they literally, he was put into jail by the Celtic priests. Now, when I look at that in relationship that all that I knew and know about what I read to you a moment ago, I just kept thinking about the fact that healing faith asks, it believes, and it follows. So where does it find you today? The thing I can't get over about this story is that you and I are Bartimaeus that we are blind and that there are moments when we get the picture, we, we get a piece of it, we get a, we get a slice of it. But in fact, Jesus wants to give us the whole deal. And the whole deal is to see through his eyes. As I've tried to do that this week in preparation to teach on this passage, I kept feeling intimidated. <laughs> because to see others through the eyes of Jesus is very scary. It's very discomforting. Because it will always cost us something. We're making our way to Passion Week where it costs Jesus everything. But if you and I want to have a healing faith, which we do, we need not to be afraid to ask, we need not to be afraid to believe, we certainly don't need to be afraid to follow. Let's do that today, right now.